name is Furman Fordham. I am the senior pastor of Riverside here in Nashville. And we want to welcome you to our Riverside family and to our ministry. We are so happy that you have tuned in. Our prayer is that you will come to know God, grow in God, and sow God's love. We are praying that this presentation will be a blessing to you. And if you are ever in Nashville, we invite you to come worship with us. May God bless you, and we look forward to seeing you soon. some praise in this house this evening. Amen. How many of you glad that the Lord revealed himself unto you when you were in a weary and dreary place, but God so loved you so much that he found you from the pits and planted your feet on solid ground. I wish there were at least five people in here who can give God praise, who had at least five things that you could thank God for. Or maybe you don't have five. Maybe you got four things you could thank God for. Or maybe you got three, but or two, or if you got one thing you can thank God for, that he rose up early Sunday morning, that he's not dead. Confucius is dead. Buddha is dead. Muhammad is dead. But Jesus is alive. Somebody say amen. So I thank God for bringing me here safely. I thank God for his provision and for his grace. I thank God for your senior pastor, Pastor Fordham, for affording me this opportunity to speak to you on this uh, wonderful weekend called Family Matters. Uh, just to let you know, and he, this may be the first time he's hearing this, but uh, your pastor had a very, very strong influence uh, on my life at a very early age. When I had accepted the call to, uh, to follow God and to gospel ministry, my aunt was received, got some tapes from DuPont SDA, and they were just getting rid of tapes, and she knew that I wanted to go into ministry, and she gave me a box full of tapes. And on that tape, one particular tape that I played over and over was by a young preacher by the name of Keith, by Keith S. Goodman and Pastor Furman Fordham. And it was a youth day, and I think you two tag teamed. It was just, matter of fact, the other day that I found out that Keith Goodman had, uh, had a preach with you as well. And I just remember hearing you preach, and I think the sermon had to do with Eli, and you were talking about Eli, how Eli, uh, Sa Eli's name, Samuel's as Samuel was watching over Eli, and Eli's name, God kept calling out Eli's name. And after I heard that sermon, I said, I want to preach like that brother. And guess what? I did preach that sermon a few times as a young man. And so I thank God for him. I appreciate him and for the work that he's done and the work that he's done here. And so I want to continue to pray for him. And you should esteem your pastor. He's a great man. Amen. And to his, his associate, Pastor Mike Polite, he is the avant-garde of youth ministries. Amen. When I need something, I go to him. It's amazing that we do think alike. I share this at my church, and I share it at your church. I have the privilege of working with his dad. And so if you've seen the son, you've seen the father. Amen. And so he's just as mighty and as powerful. And I always say that if his daddy is a gun, that means he is a son of a gun. Amen. And so he sure is a mighty man of God. And I am just so humbled to be here um, this uh, Sabbath evening to deal with your topic, Family Matters. Now, I'm too short for a long conversation, so I pray that I could just get in and get out, and then y'all could go home and we could be here tomorrow morning. And so as we deal with the topic of Family Matters, I'm going to invite you to take your Bibles, and let's go to the book of 2 Samuel chapter 9. 2 Samuel chapter 9. And the word of God reads, David asked, is there still anyone left of the house of Saul to whom I may show kindness for Jonathan's sake? Now there was a servant of the house of Saul whose name was Ziba, and he was summoned to David. And the king said to him, are you Ziba? And he said, at your service. And the king said, is there anyone remaining of the house of Saul to whom I may show the kindness of God? And Ziba said to the king, there remains the son of Jonathan. He is crippled in his feet. And the king said to him, where is he? And Ziba said to the king, he is in the house of Machir, son of Amiel, at Lodabar. Then King David sent and brought him from the house of Machir, son of Amiel, at Lodabar. And Mephibosheth, son of Jonathan, son of Saul, came to David and fell on his face 
and did obeisance. And David said, Mephibosheth. And he answered, I am your servant. David said to him, do not be afraid, for I will show you kindness for the sake of your father, Jonathan. I will restore to you all the land your grandfather saw, and you yourself shall eat at my table always. And he did obeisance and said, what is your servant that you should look upon a dead dog such as I? And the king summoned Saul's servant Ziba and said to him, all that belonged to Saul and, all, and to all his house I have given to your master's grandson. You and your sons and your servants shall till the land for him and shall bring in the produce so that your master's grandson may have food to eat. But your master's grandson, Mephibosheth, shall always eat at my table. And now Ziba had 15 sons and 20 servants. And then Ziba said to the king, according to all that my lord, the king commands his servant, so your servant will do. And Mephibosheth ate at David's table like one of the king's sons. Mephibosheth had a young son whose name was Micah. And all who lived in Ziba's house became Mephibosheth's servant. And Mephibosheth lived in Jerusalem, for he always ate at the king's table. And now he was lame in both his legs. I put a title on this text and with your prayers, I want to speak on the topic, when your bad breaks become your big break. Pray with me. Father, hide me behind your cross. May I not be seen, but may you be seen. And may your name be lifted up and glorified. And may we know, Lord, that we always have a place at your table. And this we pray in your name, Jesus Christ. Amen and amen. Every now and then, life catches up with us and handcuffs us and leaves us waiting and wondering if we will ever get a bailout. I guess it was Martin Luther King Jr. who could not have said it any better, that life is nothing more than a long, desolate corridor with no exit sign. What a debilitating and pathetic way to look at life. Is it so true that life can be like a long corridor without any light at the end of the tunnel? Have you ever felt like you were trapped behind a prison without any bars? Can it be, my brothers and sisters, that every now and then that life can go dark on you? And if you're really honest with yourself, you could find yourself in a dark place questioning your existential situation, wondering why am I alive? Why am I here today? Why do I go through some of the things that I go through? Why do I feel this way about myself? I heard a story the other day about a pastor who was traveling, and he was having a conversation with somebody else. And he talks about how he was traveling on the road and how suddenly he had ran out of gas and his tank was on empty. Without anything else to do, he was in a town that he did not know anyone in, and he had to pull over on the side of the road. What made matters worse is that there was a storm that was pouring down upon him, which had shut down the lights in the entire community. So even if he wanted to get gas. He could not get gas anyway because why? He was in a dark place, in a dark situation with nowhere to go. And if you're honest with yourself, somebody in here this evening, we find ourselves pulled over on life's highway with nowhere to go. Our life tank is on E. We are past E. We are on fumes just trying to make it every day. We wake up in the morning and how in the world are we going to be able to go through the cycle and the things that occur now and then, because sometimes you could wake up on top of the world, but go to sleep with the world on top of you. I wish somebody was honest up in here this evening that your life tank is full on E, because the sad reality and the truth is that if our life were a script, it is filled with drama, drama everywhere that you go. You got all kinds of people inside of the script of your life. Every, your life is like a movie script. You got people that love you, and you got people that hate you, but it's seems like the haters are more than the lovers in your life. If you be honest with yourself, somebody said it's like an old McDonald farm out here with a hater over there and a hater over here everywhere. A hater, hater, because that's just what haters do. They hate on you because they're not doing what you can do so well, because what happens is a hater man marries a hater woman and they have hater kids. And so that's what they do. They influx the church. And so you got all these people that are messing with you and that are dealing with you and want you to give up on this thing called life. But then also there is another script that we have in our lives because sometimes drama is caused by things that we do, but sometimes we inherit drama from our families. Yes, we inherit our daddy's dilemmas and our mama's drama. We
We inherit things that we had no control over. We inherit things that people say to us that cause us to live our lives in the way that God did not intend for us. Because why am I preaching to you this evening? Because the text tells me that Mephibosheth inherited some drama that he didn't bring upon himself. If you read in 2 Samuel chapter 4, verse 4, it says that Saul's son Jonathan had a son who was crippled in his feet, and he was five years old when the news about Saul and Jonathan came from Jezreel. His nurse picked him up and fled, and in her haste to flee, it happened that he fell down and became lame, and his name was Mephibosheth. You see, we got to be honest right now and thank God that your family, for some of us, was a stepping stone, but for most of us in here, some of us, our families were stumbling blocks. Let me pre- let me break that down a little bit better. Praise God if you had a family that was a stepping stone that helped you to get to the next level, a stepping stone that encouraged you when you didn't have nobody else, a stepping stone that opened doors for you. But for some of us in here, our families were stumbling blocks. Yeah, I'm going to be honest, stumbling blocks. They told you you ain't never going to be nothing. They told you you're going to be just like your daddy. They told you that you might as well give up right now because ain't nobody going to ever love somebody that look like you. A stumbling block. Some of you were touched inappropriately. Some of you saw things that you should not have ever seen. A family that was a stumbling block instead of a stepping stone. And isn't it sad that here Mephibosheth has a stumbling block family. Here the Bible says his caretaker dropped him as she fled to go somewhere. And as a result of dropping him, his legs became lame and he was crippled in both of his feet. And it's safe to say that isn't it messed up that the person that was supposed to love you and take care of you dropped you instead of helping you flee to safety. We have done an injustice to some of our children, to some of us who are adults in here because we were dropped at a very early age. And because we were dropped at a very early age, we are crippled. We are handicapped. We can't love the way that we want to love. We can't speak the way that we want to speak. We can't act the way that we want to act. We can't do the things we want to do. Why? Because we were dropped at an early age and we were crippled for the rest of our lives. As a matter of fact, um, the greatest boxer ever alive to jump inside of a ring, Mr. Muhammad Ali, float like a butterfly, sting like a bee. You know who I'm talking about. He was fighting Ken Norton Sr. And in the fight with Ken Norton Sr., as I'm watching it on ESPN Classic, Muhammad is not fighting like he ordinary does. It turns Turns out that the commentator said that early in round two, Muhammad Ali suffered from a broken jaw. And because of that broken jaw, he was fighting on the ropes, just holding his arms up in defense because he didn't want Ken to get any closer to him to break his jaw or to hurt him anymore. And the sad reality is that a lot of us live our lives in a defensive position. Why? Because we got hit at an early stage in our lives. You don't got to be honest with me, but you know I'm in your Kool-Aid and I got your flavor right now. We were hit and we suffered a broken jaw. Check this out. We are on the defense. We don't let people get close to us. We don't want people to get near us. We always angry when we come to church. We don't smile no more. Why? Because we were hit at an early stage in our lives and we live a life on the defense. We are so defensive that we don't even want anything to do with God because the very picture of our Christian families that dropped us at an early age has made us say, I don't want nothing to do with that God because my family was a stumbling block of hypocrites, of liars and fronters. They would smile up in the church, but they had a form of godliness denying the power thereof. Yes, that's what's happening, stumbling blocks. And here Mephibosheth is handicapped. He is crippled in both of his legs. He is lame. He has been dropped. We drop our kids, listen to this, when we drop them off at church and we expect the church to instill Christian values in them. I mean, how crazy is that? They live with you for six days of the week. We only get them for six hours on one day. You expect us to pump holiness inside of them, but for six days they got nothing.
nothing but BET, Black Embarrassing Television, MTV, Mindless Television, all up inside their head, and they expect us to make them holy. Nah, sir, it ain't going to go like that, baby bopper. You got to have worship with your family. You got to have worship with your sons and daughters. You got to teach them how to pray. That's why they come to church. They can't even sit up in the pews. Why? Because they are so engaged in the things of the world that when I talk about a God who can turn water into wine, they look at me like that's corny. That ain't nothing. Because why? They have more of the world inside of them than more of Jesus inside of them. Because the home is the first school. We drop our kids every time. We don't instill in them the values that they need to have so that they can make it. I know school is about to start, but let me tell you something. John John don't need the latest Jordans. John John don't need the latest gear when he walk up into the school. Antoinette, Antoinette Quet Ishita, whatever her name is, don't need the latest iPhone when she walk up in the class. She need a pen, a book bag, and a brain on top of her head. Because at the end of the day, that's what's going to make it. We got to stop supporting our children when they bring home bad grades. We got to stop rewarding them when they are not doing what is right. Let me tell you something. I grew up in an old-fashioned home, an old-fashioned home. There wasn't no locking no doors inside of my house. I could not close my room door. My mother would kick that thing down and be like, anything that happens in this house, I'm going to know what's going on inside this house. Because you don't pay no mortgage. You don't pay no rent. You don't pay no light. You don't do nothing up in here. So we ain't locking no doors. Let me tell you something. My mother gave me the probably the best advice that I ever had. She said, you ain't going to have no boy, no girlfriend. Praise God, no boyfriend. You ain't going to have no girlfriend when you go to school. Oh, I forgot. I have folk up behind me right now. Now, I'm going to preach to y'all, too. You ain't going to have no girlfriend. As a matter of fact, your girlfriend's name is social studies, English, biology, all them things. That's what we need to get back to. Don't drop your kids. Pick your kids up. And so as a result, Mephibosheth is lame in both legs. I talk fast. I'm from New York. But y'all going y'all gonna to buy the tape and rewind it later on. Oh, it's all right. And so Mephibosheth is lame in both legs. And he is now where? He is now in a place that he should not be. And so what we understand, our text says that David asked the question, is there anybody left? from the house of Saul that I could show kindness for Jonathan's sake. David said, look, I still going to show honor and keep my word in spite of the fact that that low down dirty Negro Saul tried to kill me, but I'm going to stick to my word. Ain't nothing better than a man who keeps his word. Ain't nothing worse than somebody who keeps wishy-washy with what they say. And because David loved Jonathan, David said, I'm going to keep my word. And so David says, I want to show kindness to them. As a matter of fact, the Hebrew for that is hesed. But you don't, know, you don't care about that. You actually care about what the word means. And so what hesed means, hesed means is that when a member is in a relationship or in a position to render help to the other, which is for some other reason or in need, that they can't help themselves. All right, let me chew it up and break it down for you real quick. Basically, what David is saying is that I'm going to use my hookup to hook up the unhooked. I love that because that's what God calls us to do. God calls us to serve people. God calls us to serve those and to help those who can't help themselves. Because the God I serve says this, that I honor you and I respect you when you are serving people. If you want to make it in the kingdom of God, God says you got to serve your way to the top. You can't uh, scheme. You can't buy it. You can't hustle for it. You got to serve your way to the top. When James and John came to Jesus, they said, Jesus, we want to be on your left and right. Jesus says, that's not for me to give, but if you serve people, then my Father in heaven will recognize it. Let me bless you real quick. My mother used to work inside of a hospital before she retired, Brookdale Hospital in Brooklyn, New York City. And every so now and then, I would go to the hospital to visit her because because I wanted to see her, and she worked on the eighth floor. Now, the thing about the hospital elevators is that 
everybody who was going up would all take the same elevator. Everybody would pile there, and sometimes you would have to wait about three times before you can get to the top. But my mother had told me that just around the bend behind these elevators are what's called the service elevators. And the service elevators ain't as pretty as the regular elevators. They stink, they carry food in there, and they carry patients in there. But she said, if you ever want to get to the top quick, take the service elevator. And I'm going to bless you real quick. God says, if you want to get to the top in my kingdom, then take the service elevator. Get down and do something for somebody who can't do it for themselves. And so David said, I'm going to use my, my position to help my fibble shit out. And so David says, because God has been good to me, I got to be good to somebody else. Because God has blessed me, I'm going to bless somebody else. And so God uses David to call Mephibosheth to come and to see him. And so Mephibosheth is now in the presence of David. But before he gets there, the text tells us that he is in low Debar. What do you mean by low Debar? I don't even got to translate that. The name sounds bad in itself. He's in low Debar. But since this is Riverside SDA and y'all some educated people, I'm going to preach this thing like I know to and do some research. He is in low Debar, and which means a place with no pasture, with no grass or no trees. It was a barren land, the howling windless, the most crepit of decrepit of Israeli sims. It was the place where the rejected of society came to live and where the outlaws would hide. So it was also a place of no enlightenment or no word. It was a hiding place and that you can see that because of his lameness, his crippleness in both his feet, he is far from Jerusalem and what happens to him is that he finds himself in a place that he should not have been in because he is a child of royalty. And that's a word right there because when we allow our lameness or how we are crippled to control us, it takes us into places that we should not be in the first place. When we allow what our families to dictate what they say about us, it puts us in places that we should not be. We attract broken things. We attract broken people. We attract broken marriages. We attract broken lifestyles and it causes us to adjust to our brokenness and to live in a desolate place and being in somewhere that we should not be right now. And so David says, call him out of Lodabar and bring him to my palace. Because when you are on God's radar, God does not make a mistake or forget where you are, even if you are in a dark place. And so because God says, I've been working this thing out because God says this, for I know the thoughts that I think towards you. Thoughts of peace and a not of evil and to give you an expected end. I love that. The word says, I, for I know the thoughts. A better word for that is for I know the invention that I think towards you. In other words, God is inventing something brand new for you that he has never done before. God is going to create something that he's never done before because the God we serve, he does not repeat his miracles. The only thing that he repeats is his forgiveness and his grace. And I love that because God God is inventing something. And so God is inventing for you. If you find yourself in Lodabar, God is inventing something for you. And so God, look how God weaves Mephibosheth's situation. The word tells him that he invited him to the place. And Mephibosheth says, why are you going to help a dead dog like me? Listen to this. Stop calling yourself names that God did not give to you. Don't call your name whatever somebody said to you in your family. You are not what people said about you. As a matter of fact, you are not your parents. You don't have to be like your mother. You don't have to be like your daddy. You are your own person. Stop calling yourself fat, ugly, stupid, ignorant, nothing, lazy. If you keep calling yourself those things, then you will become that very thing. Because I hate hearing my young people say that that's my B right there, and that's my H right there, and what's up my N word right there. Why in the world would you borrow the language of an oppressor and pull yourself down? Why would you go become a co-conspirator to the KKK and claim a name that was not yours in the first place? But if you're going to talk to me 
Call yourself king, royalty, a chosen generation, fearfully and wonderfully made, a man and woman of standard, a child of God. Don't degrade yourself, but promote yourself because that's how God thinks of you. And so David ignores it. And David says, come here, Mephibosheth. You're going to sit at my table. Do not be afraid because I'm going to show you kindness for Jonathan's sake. And so right here, he has a RSVP at the table of royalty. And so Mephibosheth is able to sit at the king's table. And so he's sitting at the table, and I love this, but the Bible says that he's crippled in both legs. He's sitting at the table, but he's crippled in both legs. So that means somebody had to put him at the table. Now what's beautiful thing about a table is this, is that when you sit, sit at a table, that means that the table is covering you and that nobody can't see your crippleness anymore. I'm preaching this thing. Y'all not understanding this right now. You see, what's the beautiful thing about a table is that when we at the table, all of us at the same level. Ain't nobody better. Ain't nobody lower. And so even as Mephibosheth is crippled and sitting at the table, we are all at the same level. But wait a minute. That ain't how the text really goes. You see, in El Greco-Roman days and back in Old Testament they didn't have tables like what we have today. They have what is called a triclinium and when you see the picture of the Last Supper that's an incorrect interpretation of the Last Supper. They did not sit down at a table at the Last Supper but instead what they did and I'm going to get down on the floor, they lay down at the table and reclined at the table and they ate at the king's table. So now picture Mephibosheth, he's lame in both legs, he is eating at the king's table, but his crippleness is behind him, and what's the blessing is in front of him. Y'all ain't praising God like I need you to right now. You see, what I thank God for is that sometimes he hides my insecurities. He hides all the pain I've been through. He hides all the stuff that I've had in my family, and he puts me at the king's table because the God we serve has a way of turning things around. God turns things around when people turn it one way, I got to bless you a little bit better, so I'm going to take you with me. Some of you have probably heard of Samuel DeWitt Proctor. Samuel DeWitt Proctor was an excellent speaker and orator and preacher of the Riverside Church in New York City. And Samuel DeWitt Proctor talks about a time when he was invited to speak at a university. Now, this was during Jim Crow era, and when they didn't really like people who were kissed by the sun's rays. You know what I'm talking about? People with rednecks, they didn't like people who looked like you and I. And so he was invited because the provost of the school had heard him speak and he was moved by the way he speak. So he invited him to come there and speak. And so Samuel Dewitt Proctor accepts the invitation and he goes over to the school to speak. And when he encounters the man that invited him, the man says to Samuel Dewitt Proctor, I didn't know that you were an African American man. You will not speak at this school. You might as well go back into your car and drive back home. And the only way you're going to speak at this school is over my dead body. And Samuel DeWitt Proctor was angry. He was livid. He said, I can't believe that I came all the way out here to speak and to be treated like that, that God would do something like that to me. Well, fast forward about 10 or 15 years later, he was invited to go back to the school. And as he decided whether or not he should go, he said, you know what? I ain't even going to sweat that brother. I'm going to go speak there because God has called me to go back there and speak. And so as Samuel DeWitt Proctor is sitting on the platform, he leans over to the current provost and he asks him, whatever happened to that man that was the old provost of the school? Well, the man leans over and says, you know, that brother loved the school so much that he gave so much to the school that we decided to bury his body right here. And Samuel DeWitt Proctor said, what do you mean? You, he said, we have buried his body right underneath this pulpit that you are about to preach at right now. And Samuel DeWitt Proctor said, you mean to tell me that I'm about to preach over his dead body? And Samuel DeWitt Proctor preached like he never had preached before. All I'm saying, I don't care how much your family was a 
hot mess, God has a way of turning things around that he will make you the head and not the tail, the first and not the last. And so here it is, Mephibosheth is at the king's table. But listen to what the text says. The text says that he is still lame in both his legs. And I'm mad that the text keeps saying he's lame in both his legs because people will always bring up your lameness and try to identify you by your lameness. But let me tell you something. You are identified by who, what, and what God says about you. And I love that because Mephibosheth has servants and he is blessed and he is at the king's table. He is no longer, he is no longer known by his family, but now he is known by what David says about him. And now I'm going to wrap this thing up and get out of your face real quick. You sitting there wondering what happened to the brother that was at the beginning of the story that had pulled over on the side of the road. Well, since you're asking me, I'm going to tell you real quick what had happened to him. Turns out that he had pulled over on the road and suddenly a voice came out of nowhere and began to speak to him inside of his car. The voice said, I noticed that you were pulled over on the road and I can tell that there is something wrong. He said, who are you? The voice on the intercom said, we are OnStar, OnStar system. And OnStar is installed in your car and we can know when something bad happens to you or you are stranded. It looks like that you have run out of gas. The man said, yes, I did. I ran out of gas. The lady, the man said, how in the world did you discover that? She says that we have satellites in the air. You can't see us, but we can see you no matter where you are. And so even no matter that you are there, we will send help to be with you to get you out of your situation. And so the man says, oh, are you going to get off the phone right now? Are you going to leave me here by myself? She says, no, we're going to stay here with you until help comes. And so all I'm trying to say today is that if you find yourself in a dark place, once you got membership in glory, God's angels look down on you and it sends help to get you out of the situation that you are in right now. And so even if my family is a mess, I'm on God's radar. God picked me up and turned me around and plant my feet on solid ground. God is going to fix me so that I can fix my family. I'm going to break this cycle today. I'm going to be somebody for my children. I'm going to be somebody for my daughter. I'm going to love my son the way that he needs to because I discovered in the word of God that there's a lot of families that were hot messes. Look at Jacob. Come here, Jacob, and testify. I got an uncle who was a hustler. My daddy was a hustler. My mama was a hustler. My name was a liar, but God turned me around and it changed my name to Israel, and now I could do great things. Well, come here, David. Testify about your children. My son Absalom hated me so much that it wanted to kill me. My other son raped my other daughter, but God still said, I am a man after your own heart. God can turn things around. Well, if you don't believe me, come here, Jesus, and testify. Jesus says, have you ever looked at my family tree in my book of Matthew and in Luke? I got a prostitute in there. I got a hustler in there. I got an alcoholic in there named Abraham. I got every liar and a murderer, but I still did what God called me to do. I still hung on the tree for you. I still did what I need. So I don't care where you come from. God can take you where you need to be because the God I serve is an almighty God. He's a loving God. He fixes families. He wants you to be in glory for your children. And even though you are crippled, you've been hurt real bad, God can still use you to bless your family to make it into glory. And so sometimes your bad break becomes your big break. You see, some of us go through situations. And the problem with us is that it is cycles. We have cycles of pain in our family. We got, we got, we got married folk who are just roommates. They just sleep in different rooms. And our children are watching this. They drive to church with smiling faces. They sit up in here and they look great. And when they go home, it's nothing but drama in there. And God is calling the family. You see, one of the things that the devil had to attack was the family. 
If anything that he's going to destroy, it is the family. And so here Mephibosheth, here he is dropped by somebody who was supposed to take care of him. He's lame in both his legs. He's in low the bar. Some of y'all right now are in low the bar right now. Not physically, but mentally. You got to load the bar state of mind. That you can't do better. That you can't go better. That you can't reach for the highest. You settle for less. And so God is calling you, Mephibosheth. God is calling you. Because why? Is that song they sang earlier. That God is able to do just what he said he would do. He's going to fulfill every promise to you. Don't give up on God because he won't give up on you because he's able. And so here Mephibosheth, because of his lameness, was in low debar, and he was in a bad place. And because a lot of us are crippled, we don't know how to love, we end up in bad relationships. People that take from us instead of investing in us. Because what happens in a relationship that when there are more withdrawals than there are investments, you become emotionally bankrupt. And so that when you are ready to get married, you have nothing to give because all you kept doing was pouring out into somebody who was taken from you. See, love gives and lust takes. But all of that is a trickle down of bad family dynamics, dysfunctional, being dropped. There's some parents in here who, have, who were dropped at an early age. And because of your crippleness, you don't even know how to react to your kids. But the sad reality is that when you look at your children, you see yourself. It's like you're looking at a mirror. And you see everything that you did is now coming to pass. And now God is trying to tell you. You see, the reason why God saves you, he wants you to save your family as well. And so if the musician can play that song, God is able to do just what he said he would do. I want to speak to the Mephibosheths in here. He was dropped when he was only five years old. Praise God that God preserved him because he could have died. Praise God that God preserved you because you could have been dead right now. But God preserves you because you got to make a difference. You need to reconcile with your son or your daughter. You need to first reconcile with God. Text says that he was still crippled in both his feet. He, he didn't get new legs. But he adjusted and he still played in the midst. You know, one of my favorite players is Kobe Bryant. And in the finals against the Boston Celtics, ESPN said that Kobe had a broken finger. And they showed, matter of fact, throughout the season, they were showing how he played with his brokenness. And so they had stats of him before the brokenness and stats of him after brokenness. And before the brokenness, he was doing good. But they showed that after, with the brokenness of his finger, that he was playing a lot better. And so when they asked Kobe about what was going on, he said that I learned to adjust and play the game even though I was broken and hurting. You see, because I had the right medical attention, they were able to give me something so that it can help me perform the way I need to perform even while I am broken. And I sat there, I said, thank you, ESPN, because God has a chart and he shows us that how we lived our lives before, but after brokenness, that we could still play this game called life better than how we played it the first time. So my appeal today, are there any Mephibosheths in here? I know it's a very, a very vulnerable time. And maybe you don't want people to know that you are broken or you have been broken. But right now, I'm going to ask you to put everything to the side and not think about anybody else but your relationship with God. And you want God to put you together so that even though the hurt and the pain in your life won't dictate you or your family, so that when Jesus cracks the sky, you can all be holding hands together to make it over to glory. Maybe there's a child in here, a young person. 
you feel broken. You have no relationship with your parents. You have no relationship with anybody. The only relationship you have is with Facebook or Twitter or Instagram. No humans, just letters on a screen that you connect with from day to day. But now you need to be restored so that someday when you grow up, that your family can be tightly knit so that you don't drop anybody that you've been asked to care for. So if you fall into any of those categories, as the praise team sings and as we sing, God is able to do, I'm going to ask you to stand and we're going to have prayer together. And you can join in and sing with the praise team as well. And there's one or two people in here, two persons in here that say, I just want God to put me together so that my family can make the glory. You're thinking about your cousins. You're thinking about your aunts. You're thinking about your parents. You're thinking about your children right now. And you are not confident in the fact that I may not make it or they may not make it. And Lord, all I want to see is them make it into glory. Let's sing together. God is able to do.